Plain Talk podcast. I'm your host, Rob Port. Later in the show, Senator Kevin Kramer takes your questions. Remember, he's on every week, so if you want to submit questions, you can do so to Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com. Uh, really, anytime you think about it, you don't have to wait until, uh, you know, it's the day before he's going to be on or the day of. Uh, you can, you know, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and you come up with a question for the senator for some reason, send it over to me. I'll uh, I'll save it and I'll ask him. We've been getting a lot of questions for the senator. In fact, it ended up being a pretty long interview today uh, just so that we could get to all the questions and, and let him answer them in full. But you know what? That's OK. Uh, he's making his time available. I'm making this podcast available to provide a venue a venue for this sort of thing. So uh, if you're into it, participate by all means. But before we get there, I, I want to talk maybe a little bit more about a topic we had on the show earlier this week. I had on uh, Jennifer Galbraith. She is an epidemiologist with the North Dakota Department of Health, and we were talking about vaccinations. Now, nationally, measles are becoming a problem again. In fact, there was one city in our country that went so far as to ban unvaccinated people from public places, things like playgrounds and schools and well, even grocery stores. Now, I'm honestly not sure how I feel about that. Uh, I feel like there, there may be some constitutional issues at play there. But what, what's interesting is, is my, my interview with Jennifer Galbraith, and also I had a, a print column in the newspapers uh, about this as well. My argument is essentially that vaccinations are good they're not perfect not saying that uh you know there's there's certainly uh it's it's been a uh, throughout the history of vaccinations there's been constant improvement and also everybody's medical history everybody's situation is unique for some people vaccinations aren't right you know their, their doctor is going to advise them that they shouldn't get vaccinated because of medical reasons and well that's okay too uh, my problem though is is there's a there's a very anti I want to say anti-science, and I, I realize that's a loaded term with everything about the, the climate change. I think there's a lot of people out there who, you know, hang a lab coat on their political opinions and call it science and then accuse anybody who disagrees with their political opinions of being anti-science. So I want to be careful not to fall into that trap. But to me, the efficacy of vaccinations on the whole, again, acknowledging that they've not been perfect and there's been a long history of of work and uh, by, by medical professionals to improve vaccinations, but on the whole, they have reduced suffering in society. On the whole, vaccinations have ensured that fewer people get sick, fewer people suffer, fewer people die. And it, it's frustrating to me on a very personal level to see people fight this. It's frustrating to me to, to hear people talk about vaccinations as though they're poison and they're saying, well, I'm not going to poison my kid. I'm not going to put, uh, uh, I'm not, not going to put, you know, chemicals in my kid's blood. And it frustrates me. Now I, I realize some of this comes from a very personal place. I had uh, a, a relative at one point in my life who got very sick. This is not a vaccination story, but she got very sick, uh, but it was a treatable disease. Um, a, a disease where, you know, treating it doesn't guarantee outcome, but, uh, you know, it certainly could have prolonged her life, if nothing else, and, and maybe she could have even survived. But she didn't because her parents belonged to a religion that frowns on, and in fact doesn't, uh, frowns on things like blood transfusions and bone marrow transfusions and things like that. Maybe I'm giving some of this away by saying that. I'm, I'm trying not to give away too many details because it is private, but I will tell you that I and others in my family had to watch as this member of our family was, was allowed to die with her parents looking on because of religious belief. That was hard to swallow. Uh, and I will tell you that to this day when I think about it, it fills me with, with rage I don't understand why, when human endeavor has made scientific advancements, medical advancements, technological advancements that can allow us to live happier lives, more healthy lives, longer lives, why would we not avail ourselves of this? I am deeply respectful of sincerely held religious beliefs. I think that everybody ought to be able to live their lives the way, the way they want to live. But the, the vaccination issue, the medical care issue has a wrinkle to that. If you were just making decisions for yourself, well then fine. C'est la vie. We're all going to go through this life and we all should be able to go through this life in a manner that we see fit. The problem though is when you start making decisions for other people, 
when you make a decision not to vaccinate your child, from my point of view, you're putting your child at risk. And when you make a decision not to vaccinate yourself or your child, you're putting other people at risk. Right? So there's the herd immunity issue, right? Where if we drop below a certain level uh, of, of vaccination, that creates space where diseases like the measles i mean we're, we're literally seeing this right now where diseases like the measles can come back and cause more suffering and even death that's a very real problem also there are people in our society who can't we just just refer to them there are people in our society who cannot vaccinate for for medical reasons they cannot get the shot well, even if they wanted to it would do them more harm than good because of some unique set of medical circumstances that's unique to them they cannot get vaccinated it's incumbent upon the rest of us to vaccinate in order to protect those people also by the way the elderly sometimes even if they were vaccinated earlier in life later in life they become weaker their immune systems become and i'm not a doctor here but this is just i mean this is just logical this just makes sense these older people are or, or maybe people who have, have have become sick or whatever uh you know they're susceptible to these diseases as well so it's important that we vaccinate in order to protect them. I, I mean, to me, it's it's a societal responsibility. Now, in the past, I, I think we've been very lucky where the number of people who have opted to not vaccinate has been relatively low. In fact, so low that it didn't really matter if, if we put in, in the law, uh, you know, some allowances to let people opt out. Uh, just for for personal reliefs or religious beliefs, right? North Dakota has has three exemptions, right? And and as as you heard with my interview with Jennifer Galbraith earlier this week, there's three exemptions. There's the medical exemption, which we've discussed. There's a religious exemption, and then there's the the largest source of exemptions, which is just a personal belief exemption, where you can exempt your kids from getting or yourself from getting vaccinated for pretty much any reason at all. You just have to say, well, it's, you know, because of some sincerely held personal beliefs that I have, I'm not going to get vaccinated. And you're allowed to do that. And if, as long as it was small numbers, it was fine. But now that those numbers are growing and they are growing in North Dakota, right? We go back a decade and it was like around 1% of, of kindergartners uh, were, were being exempted for, for personal belief reasons. That number is up over 3%. It's almost 4% if we count the religious exemption people. It's growing. And what, what troubles me is it's growing because of ignorant things that people believe. And, and this is what's, what's kind of amazing to me. In, in response to my print column and in response to the interview I did with Jennifer Galbraith um, earlier this week, people have come out of the woodwork to attack me. And granted, I've given it to them back a little bit. And so maybe I've called some of it down on myself. But I come out of the work to just go on the attack. And anybody who would suggest that that vaccinations work, it's it's sort of amazing to me. And, and what's really frustrating is is the sources these people. I mean, they're using you know discredited bureaucrats. I've had no fewer than half a dozen chiropractors who work in the state of North Dakota. Chiropractors who, I, although they call themselves doctors, are not qualified to talk about things like injections are not qualified to talk about, you know, epidemiology or, or you know, back, viruses or anything like that. It, they're no more qualified to talk about it than I am. Now, listen, I, I think we should all be able to debate this as a societal question, as a public policy question, but I'm not on here giving people medical advice. I support, uh, I, I support, um, I support vaccinations because people I trust and smart people and a lot of them say it works. And also, we have data collected by academics, data collected by government agencies, federal agencies, state agencies, local agencies. We have all sorts of this data, nonprofits. We have all of this data, which shows the same thing. There is a strong correlation between society getting vaccinated and a decline in communicable diseases. I'm not the one saying that. Experts are saying that. Meanwhile, people who have no business... It's weighing in on, on these matters. It, it is far outside their areas of expertise are now suddenly saying, oh, you know, I'm a doctor. Therefore, this, that, and the other thing about vaccinations. You know, they, people telling me to watch this movie, Vaxxed, which was, by the way, produced by a discredit, by, by the discredited researcher who was the source for the original myth that there's a link between vaccinations and autism. That man is a fraud. That man is a huckster. 
That man has been discredited. His research has been withdrawn from the peer-reviewed publications in which it was published. And yet still, still, his malfeasance lives on. It, it's really it's really sort of amazing. And, and by the way, this doesn't cross. I got an email from a, uh, a, a listener, Sandra. She emailed and she says, or I, I should say she's a reader. She read the print column. Sandra emailed. She says, uh, Mr. Port, I found your opinion piece on anti-vaccinations quite interesting. This is the only time I would ever contact you as I find your anti-liberal diatribe disgusting. I feel that I must correct you as to your assessment of the liberal population not vaccinating. I have two brother-in-law, brothers-in-law, doctors of chiropractic, that spread the myth about, ma- va- about vaccines and autism. They are 100% Republican, as are the majority of the family. One of these families have not vaccinated their children, and a few years ago, their children got whooping cough. All three of them were very ill and could have spread this horrible disease to innocent bystanders. Again, this is not a liberal issue. Well, I would note that in my column, I didn't say it was a liberal issue. In fact, I pointed out that anti-vaccination sentiment crosses party lines. It's actually kind of amazing. I mean, there are uber-rich Hollywood celebrities, right? Uh, you know, models and actors and everything who think that that vaccines cause autism. They're opposed to vaccines. There are poor people, dirt poor people, who believe the same thing. There are granola-eating atheist hippies, right, or or, or New Age Wiccans who are anti-vaccination, and there are Bible-thumping fundamentalist Christians who are anti-vaccinations. This nonsense transcends traditional political and social lines like few other issues. And in a lot of ways, I, I think it's... It's an illness in our society, and, and there's a lot of this sort of ignorance, I, I think, especially in the age of the Internet. There's a lot of this sort of ignorance that has cropped up. I mean, you look at the rise of the Flat Earth Society. I just watched a documentary about that on Netflix. I'm forgetting the name of it now. Uh, I'm sure you can find it. It's excellent. I mean, it's an interesting look. And, and the thing is, is these are not dumb people who believe this. I mean, these are relatively successful, relatively intelligent people who, for whatever reason, have decided that the Earth is flat. And they now accept it as an article of faith, and they're not going to back down. You know, any any evidence to the contrary, they're just going to loop into their into their conspiracy. They're just going to you know weave it into the fabric of what they want to believe, and on it goes. There's no convincing these people, and it's scary. And so I think that brings us to the question: What do we do about this? And and I'll tell you, I I have a hard time supporting mandatory vaccinations. I just do. Uh, And the reason why I have a hard time supporting mandatory vaccinations is that it's not, it's not something, I I don't want the government to just be able to stick a needle in your arm without you being able to have a say in it. And and also, I think it's counterproductive to try to force people to do the right thing. I, I think generally in society, we're better off if we inspire people to choose to do the right thing. If you force people, it's just going to breed, you know, resentment. And really, you end up making martyrs out of people, right? Because if you force people, then now they're martyrs, and now they have even more, you know, reason to complain. Oh, look what the government's forcing me to do against my will, right? I I don't want to turn anybody into a martyr. And so I think everybody should be able to make their choices about vaccinations. And as much as it it hurts my soul to say this, I, I think even you got to let parents make that decision for their kids. I think that sucks. I wish the kids had a say in it, but I can't think of it. Unless we're going to have the state start raising everybody's kids, and that's not a road I want to go down, I think you got to let them make those decisions. But on the flip side, I think maybe there should be some consequences for those decisions. And when I say consequences, I think, you know, already – To get admitted to schools, you have to be vaccinated. Now, we have some exemptions to that. I think maybe those exemptions should end. I think we should get rid of the religious exemption. I think that we should get rid of the personal choice exemption. At the very least, we should get rid of the personal choice exemption. If you want to go to public schools, if you want to enjoy that benefit that the taxpayers provide, then you need to be vaccinated. I think that if you want to get admitted to a public college, a public university, you need to be vaccinated. If you want to qualify for federal aid, for for federal student loans, I think you need to be vaccinated or have a valid medical exemption. I am all for medical exemptions. I think that those are just fine. 
But outside of those, I, I think there's a lot of things that we could do for the government, a lot of programs, a lot of benefits that we could say, listen, if you want these things, well, we need proof that you're vaccinated. You're allowed to make your choices, but the rest of us aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have to, you know, just pretend like you're not making a choice that puts the rest of us in danger. The rest of us are allowed to respond to that. You can make your choices and we can make ours. And I think there's a lot of choices we can make to, to, if you choose not to be vaccinated, if you choose to make our society more dangerous by not vaccinating, we can choose for that to have consequences for you. I think that's the right path forward. Senator Kevin Kramer joins me next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. Senator Kevin Kramer joins me now, as he does every week, to take your questions. Remember, if you want to submit your questions, you can at any time to rob at sayanythingblog.com. Also, I put up uh, social media threads on uh, Facebook and Twitter under my account, Rob Port, under Say Anything Blog. Uh, so if you follow those accounts, you'll see those uh, threads every week. You can feel free, uh, free to throw your uh, your question in there. But I know not everybody maybe not wants their name uh, publicly attached to their questions. So if you want to email them to me as well. Uh, you can certainly do that. Once again, that's Rob at SayAnythingBlog.com. Kevin, how you doing? I'm doing well, thanks, Rob. It's a kind of a wild and woolly week in Washington this week with the, the big rules change that we're in the middle of today, and this, of course, being Wednesday. Um, so that's that's been a little bit a little bit exciting to say the least. So well, why why Wednesday? You guys vote on rule changes on Wednesday. Why is it? <laughs> not generally. I just wanted to make sure, realizing that we're not on, we're not on live. That uh, if people might listen to this, that they know that, that we're oh, doing sure. this vote on Wednesday. Yeah, we yeah. we we actually record these every podcast. I usually record the day before, except for Mondays. Usually, I hit that on Friday. But yeah, so we're we're recording this on Wednesday. Uh, people will be listening to this on Thursday. You sent out a press release uh, earlier this week uh, on the, the I guess it's the Senate nominations reform. I, I think that's what we're calling this. Your statement, right, your right. statement yesterday was, I quote, over the last two years, the Senate has filed clo- cloiture on 148 nominees and conducted cloiture votes on 128 of them. At this pace, if cloiture is required on each nomination, it could take more than five years to confirm all of President Trump's remaining nominees. The system has to change. I voted for these common sense reforms to modernize the nominations process and ensure and arcane procedural tactics cannot be weaponized to enforce such unprecedented obstruction against the current president and any future president. I, this makes a lot. I, I have some reserves. I like the filibuster for policy. I think maybe you and I disagree on that, but for nominations, I think at some point, at some point you just got to let the president govern, right? It's his right. administration. Yeah. He should appoint who he wants. If if you can't if if you can't if he appoints somebody truly truly awful to a position, whether it's President Trump or some future president, if they appoint somebody who's just completely inappropriate or completely unqualified, you know, you would hope that there would be a bipartisan, a large enough bipartisan majority to block that, thus fulfilling right. Congress's advice and consent role. But outside of that, it's the president. You know, if just because you might differ with you know one of his picks philosophically well he won the election at some point you just got to let him govern well and what's interesting about this is first of all the the filibuster i i i think you make an important distinction by the way between what's called the legislative calendar that's policy laws and the what's called the executive calendar that's the confirmation process of uh, you know judges and justices and and uh, cabinet members and then a whole bunch several hundred sub cabinet members and so those are those are different but but the filibuster, the cloture, which is that's the vote that you know to end debate, and then you have another thirty hours of debate. Um, that's that's never been used up until two thousand and three. That was never used for confirmations or, or, or nominations. Even Clarence Thomas, who is the most controversial you know justice ever confirmed to the Supreme Court prior to Brett Kavanaugh, 
Uh, in fact, he, he passed on a 52 to 48 floor vote and did you, not come out. Do you think he was more controversial committee. than Bork? Was he more controversial? Because Bork didn't even make it, though. Well, well it, but he didn't make it, right. And there were others like uh, Miguel Estrada that, that didn't make it. There were, there were others that didn't get through to your previous point, actually. And probably some of them really good people like Bork. But now with, with Clarence Thomas, um, as harshly as, as Democrats opposed him, Nobody asked for closer. Nobody required 60 votes. And so um, that was that's a brand new tradition that was started, ironically, maybe not so ironically, by um, Chuck Schumer when he was a, a new junior senator from New York and uh, George Bush had become president. And, and uh, he he's the one that did a little seminar, brought a couple of liberal law professors in and and taught them how to use all the tools in the tool, tool chest to stop the clock, if you will and prevent uh, prevent George Bush's people from getting confirmed. But just to put it in further context, um, that those 128 cloture votes that happened in the first two years of the Trump administration, the previous three presidents in their, in, in their first two years had a grand total of 24 cloture votes. So I think four for one, eight for one, and 12 for one. And so it really is a phenomenon that has, you know, there's, to start it in 2003 and really escalated, obviously, this with this president and including Rob, by the way, you know, 30 hours of debate on the, the uh, general counsel to the USDA, you know, people who pass with unanimous votes after the 30 hours. So, you know, they're just using the procedural trick to stop the clock and, and not let the, uh, President Trump fill his sub cabinet and his executive positions. So. Um, you know, abuse is abuse is when rules get changed. That's you know, that's what results when you abuse the rules is you, you get new rules. So um, but th- we're not talking about some 200 year old tradition here. We're talking about a two decade tradition, yeah. not even. Well, and, and I mean, listen, if, if we're in a situation where it takes longer than the president's term in office that he's elected to to confirm right. all of his appointments, something's wrong. I mean, something's broken That's with that. Right. And, and again, it's That's it's right. not about, well, I don't like Trump, so I don't want any of his nominees. That can't be the standard. Trump won the election. That's President right. Obama won the election. I didn't like a lot right. of his nominees. I didn't like a lot of their their philosophical uh, leanings or what have you, their, their policy preferences. But Obama won. He gets to a point. And, you know, at some point, you you just got to live with that. So so what are you voting? You said you're in the midst of votes today. What What are you voting on to change today? Yeah, that's a great question because first we, first thing we did is yesterday we invoked culture to vote on a, a rules change in hopes that we could get, you know, some, some Democrats to go along with the rule change. And by the way, all we were doing is really changing the rule back to the way we agreed to it, agreed with Democrats to do when Barack Obama was president. That's the other rich irony here is uh, there was a two-year stint that, uh, that, that Republicans joined Democrats to change the rules back to, you know, to, to similar to what they are now. But the problem is it was sunset in two years. So the way this works is they, they didn't, uh, dem, no Democrat voted for the rule change. So therefore, we then took it upon ourselves as the majority to change the rules, to change the rules. And the way, way it happens, it sounds very nerdy, but the way it happens is first there was an, uh, a confirmation a nominee that was presented today for for cloture and um, that passed. And then the leader, Leader McConnell, made a motion to change from 30 hours to two hours for this sub-cabinet nominee. And that then has requires a rule of the chair and an appeal to the chair. So we're ruling on or voting on these things and just finished that, that, that what I just concluded, an appeal on the ruling of the chair. So now that the, we're in the middle of the two-hour debate on this sub-cabinet member. When that's done, then the leader's going to present a district court nominee will do the same exercise and then vote to change the rule and appeal the, the the chair's ruling and then that'll go for two hours and what that does rob is that sets precedent going forward and just so people know and i think this is an important point as republicans who are in a, a 53 47 majority in the senate with a republican president we are we are voting to make this permanent so that we, we are prepared to live with the very same rule when the t- when the tables are turned, for the, all the reasons you, you just you've just said, elections have consequences. This is not the legislative calendar. This is not the filibuster. This is simply 
the executive calendar and, and allowing the president. And I might even add, Rob, there is the other check and balance. It's, it's not just 30 hours of debate. And by the way, we're not talking about 30 hours. It's just a 30 hour clock where sometimes they take as little as one or two minutes of debate, but they still run out the 30 hour clock. What we're talking about, you still have the committee process where there's the background checks and, and, uh, and the, you know, the hearing process and the interview process. So it's not like we're just, you know, throwing people into these positions either. There's, there's plenty of process to, to cover it all. Let me ask last question on this, then we're going to move on. Sure. Could, could part of the reform be maybe we don't need to have the Congress confirm some of these people? Uh, I, and I, I say that, I look at sometimes at North Dakota and, and some of our statewide elected offices, like insurance commissioner. All due respect to John Godfrey. I think he's a great guy. I'm not real sure why we're electing that office. Uh, you know, I, they're, they're not making policy. So I think sometimes we get carried away and is, is it that sort of a thing? Are we confirming too many people? At some point, can we just can we just say, Mr. President, hire who you want? You know, maybe we don't need. I mean, I, and I'm not talking about like like judges and stuff like that. Okay, I get it. But some of this stuff, you know, and I, I had a great example, and now I'm forgetting it. But if somebody like do a trade office or something. Like, come on, yeah. can the president just hire somebody? We can just get over it. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So you there are a lot of a lot. Of, I mean, several hundred, maybe thousands of. In fact, I'm sure there are uh, more than a thousand, maybe two thousand that require confirmation and what they often are. A lot of them are in the military. A lot of them are, you know, combatant commanders for the various, you know, the various theaters and, and functions in the, in the military. But a lot of them are undersecretaries, assistant undersecretaries, deputy secretaries, deputy undersecretaries, um, you know, general counsels, all kinds of positions that require the confirmation of the Senate. And I think you raise a very important and valid point. But the challenge then is, if they're not political, how do you, there needs to be some system for differentiating between political and career bureaucrats as well. Um, I'd be all for loosening up the rules as it relates to, you know, the ability to get rid of people that, that aren't performing because there's a whole bunch of that in the federal government as well. And they're protected by, you know, these civil service rules that, that, that aren't very well thought or at least they, they don't, they benefit the bureaucrat a lot more than they do the taxpayer. And so somehow it would require a, a lot of reform, but I think you make a good point. I don't think everything needs to be confirmed by the Senate. I don't feel it's, let's face it, it's not like we're looking deep into every assistant deputy undersecretary of agriculture uh, in, in their background to make an informed decision as a Senate anyway. I had some other questions that I wanted to ask you, but our submitted questions actually pretty much covered everything. So we're going to get right into them, and we have quite a few of them this week. So uh, going to start with Duke on Facebook. He says, please ask him why it is so hard for Republicans to observe the Trump model of standing up to the media and not cover, uh, not cowering to the demands of the anti-Americans. I really want to know why the Republicans refuse to hold their ground and why they continue to let government get bigger and bigger. Do they believe in limited government or not? Well, that sounds like two questions. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, I mean, there's the media thing which there is no question that Donald Trump has uh, um, that Donald Trump stands his ground to, to, to quote the, the, the questioner. I mean, he, he's exactly right. And, and I think there are people that have observed it and thought, you know, this works better than I might've thought it did to stand up to them and to push back hard. Um, never admit, a, you know, never admit uh, a mistake, even in some cases, but to always play the, the strong position. He does always come from the strongest position and pushes back hard and it you know because some people might think it hasn't worked for him i happen to think it's worked p pretty well for him as you know i haven't been afraid to stand up to the media either i do differentiate however between um what i consider free market media that is to say people who aren't riding on you know fed on federally supported uh, or federally funded airwaves and then um you know media that i think has a little more responsibility to fairness and mainly of course networks um, you, you, I think you've commented some on even my my position of political expression at, at banks. If, if laws banks want to be insured by the federal government, I think they have a different responsibility than you know than a pawn shop downtown. But um, I do think I, I do think that Donald Trump has you know at least demonstrated a new standard for, that some may want to try to follow. Um, I, I happen to. I'm one who's who's never easily I, I shouldn't say never I'm one that's not easily offended by the media I don't even mind for the hard hitting questions um, sometimes you know sometimes they get the best of me and sometimes I might get the best of them but at the end I think that the public is pretty well served by very free and open media and then and then the public will decide which one they want to pay attention to much like people who listen to this podcast or or read your blog um, 
with regard to limited government, so the, so the Trump model, I don't know that, you know, I mean, Donald Trump has presented some pretty conservative budgets. Uh, and of course, he's advocated and, and passed some really strong um, tax cuts. Um, I don't know that he's the real limited government guy, but he's the most limited government president we've had in a very, very long time. I think if if, if I might just sort of take some liberty with what the, the, the person might be re- referring to, it might just be the ability to say no. And that is a difficult thing in politics when you have 50 states with two senators each and 435 members of Congress who largely view their re-election as a um, test of whether they're able to pre- you know, perform or produce for the people back home. And it, it, I think you've raised the issue pretty regularly with regard to, for example, in our case, um, farm programs. Um, but even Donald Trump didn't want to tackle Social Security. And if you don't tackle Social Security you're never going to you know, get to the limited government that we, you know, we'd all like to see. Uh, next is Greg from Facebook. Why do welfare people and the Muslim people get more money and EBT for food, yet people who work for 50 hours get so little for all the work they did to build the country? Why can't retired people get EBT for food? And again, two questions. I, I'm not sure welfare people, Muslim people, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure what he means yeah. there, but uh, I, I think everybody, I mean, there's no like racial or, or religious qualification, right. I, you know, mo- mostly it's like an economic means testing. You know, you, right. if you're below a certain level, you qualify for food testing. So I'm not real sure what he's there, uh, but let's, let's focus on uh, EBT for, uh, for retired people, for, for the elderly. Is that yeah. something uh, that's, that's on your radar? Well, here's what, the way I would look at the safety net program. And I think that, you know, again, I, I'm with you. I don't know what, what a particular religion or ethnic ethnicity has to do with any of it, but, I do think when we look at our safety net programs, if we want to talk, you know, uh, food support, um, I, you know, food for the hungry, that's a, that's a good area. The one thing that I think that conservatives sometimes miss is creating perverse incentives for people to work. So on the one hand, if your fee, if, if everything's free, you have an incentive to not work. On the other hand, if somebody goes to work and the first thing the government does is pulls away all of their services, then you also create an incentive for people to not work. In, in other words, in other words, I think we need to find a more measured approach, whether it's child care, whether it's food stamps or, or, or you know, SNAP, um, whether it's, you know, heating, home heating assistance. What we ought to do is not punish people for getting a job. Um, but at the same time, we have to find some way to wean people t- toward a, you know, a, a living wage, if you will, a job that provides a living wage. But there are lots of people that have a lot to offer and to provide in terms of productivity to our society that, um, we don't give a lot of incentive to, to, you know, to get a job because it's more productive not to and we punish them if they do. So. Well, I, I, sort I think, of a longer philosophical answer, but. I, I think what happens is, is you get to a point where you're on the bubble, right? Like maybe you're. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're to a point where you're going to get a job, but that job is going to boost you over the, the, you know, the, the, the means testing for whatever program you're on, whether it's like heating assistance or food stamps or right. TANF or, or whatever it is. It's, there's like a gap there. And I, I think sometimes we, you, you're right. We've created that and there becomes this sort of chasm that you have to like leap or you somehow have to have to negotiate if you want to get back into the workforce back to a place where you're gonna you know maybe be self-sufficient you got to try to jump over this this chasm because the minute you get a job and you start getting some income in now all the support you've been leaning on falls away so what we need is is more like an on-ramp right it's like you know we gotta get we gotta get we gotta let people get in a slow lane for a little while let them get up to speed with everybody else and then maybe slowly start Pulling some of the some of it back and, and letting them stand on their two feet, but you can't just you know push them and, and expect them to jump over this cliff. So that's yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, and when you look at our economy today, Rob, I mean one of the the biggest challenges we have in our economy today is a workforce, and yet we still have nearly a third of our eligible workforce not working. So, and I'm not talking about people in unemployment. I'm just talking about actual workforce participation. We continue to have a pretty low workforce participation rate, and a lot of this is the result of exactly what you and I are talking about. And that, plus some other things like you know, a disconnected uh, education system that you know, that pushes four-year degrees in five years, six years, and MBAs when a CDL is a better you know is a better yeah. certificate. Yeah. And we just 
a lot of, some of that's cultural, but some of it's very intentional at the state level. I, as well. I, I think the other mistake conservatives make is we, as a lot of us start thinking that those people who are afraid to jump over that, that, that chasm, right? They're, you know, they've got, right. they've got some support programs and they're on them, but now they're afraid to take that next step because if they lose them and we start thinking, you know, oh, they're lazy, they don't want to work, whatever. Insulting these people is not going to help. And a lot of them, it's, it's not right. that they don't want to work. It's not like they like being where they're at. It's just, you know, we've created a situation where there's risk there. And I, I think they get scared. And I, I think a lot of us would be scared if we were in that situation. So I don't you know. think there's any question. I'm with you. I, I agree. It, it's not, there's no one size fits all. Obviously, no, there is. We isn't. can do a lot better. We can. Uh, next question. Robin asks It seems like all Republicans, except a few, want to just spend, spend, spend. It's the same thing the Democrats want to do, just a different letter tied to a name. Can Senator Kramer commit to voting for, submitting, and writing fiscally responsible and conservative bills? Can Senator Kramer commit to upholding the Constitution, which may go against what the president wants? So we always have to uphold the Constitution. We pledge that when we get sworn in. And then every bill that gets introduced has to pass a constitutional you know, muster. And then or every bill that gets introduced, it has to be signed off on as, as uh, a, a statement of Constitution it is part of the actual bill. The, the, the thing, though, about, um, you know, responsible uh, spending, for example, uh, as well, you know, I'm on the budget committee. We just passed out a, a, a pretty lean budget by comparison um, last week. It didn't get much, if any, uh, coverage whatsoever, but it does create a, a glide path toward toward a balance over the, the years. But again, if we don't deal with um, and even President Trump doesn't want it to, to deal with the Social Security, Medicare, a little bit on Medicare now in terms of waste, fraud, and abuse. And that's what our bill did. It, it, it goes after waste, fraud, and abuse, um, even in even in USDA programs. And you know, I'm a I'm a strong proponent, obviously, of the Farm Bill. It was on the Farm Bill Conference Committee, uh, but our ours has a nine billion dollar savings uh, by going after waste, fraud, and abuse in the. Uh, in, in the safety net for or the SNAP program specifically, and so um, yeah, we need to we need to continue that. I do do exactly what what they're talking about. But here's the better thing: How about extending the Constitution? I'm all for a constitutional amendment that re, that requires a balanced budget. And if they want to make it in 10 years or 15 years, so we can sort of glide into it, I'm all about that because I think the only way. In fact, I appreciated the way that that, that email started out. It was. Uh, with the exception of a very few, it seems like all Republicans, you know, want to spend. Well, the one thing that would help that would be a constitutional amendment because then you'd have no choice but to find ways to cut. Uh, either that or, God forbid, the other outcome would be higher taxes because the other way to balance a budget is to add revenue. And as we know, or at least I believe, you know, raising taxes doesn't add revenue. It just hurts the economy. Marv uh, wants to secede from where he's currently living. Marv on Facebook says, I'm from northwest Minnesota. Ask him what steps we need to take to get annexed by North Dakota. <laughs> well, you know, what we should have done, I, I've often joked when when, uh, when those guys push for the uh, Red River diversion coming on our side of the uh, our side of the border, we should put on the Minnesota side of the border, and then we could have taken western Minnesota into North Dakota. <laughs> we have a lot more in common with them than they have with re, Minneapolis. Re, reroute um, the red? I do love that what we're, yeah, <laughs> reroute the red. That was my motto. Yeah, yeah there we go. Uh, Brock asks, uh, again via Facebook, ask him about the Republican health care plan. How is it going to improve the system for middle-class North Dakotans? And just to expand on that, we've gotten a lot of, I mean, President Trump, you know, said, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to go, we're going to go pivot to health care. And that's not exactly what he said, yeah, but yeah. kind of, kind of what he implied. And then majority leader McConnell saying, Oh no, you know, let's pump the brakes on that a little bit till after the elections. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, you know, after everything, I'll go repeal and replace, repeal and replace. And then our replace plan failed. And Republicans have really lost me on health care. And this latest, I mean, this is not inspiring a lot of confidence where the president says, right. Hey, let's get something cooking on health care. Senate Senate Leader McConnell says, "Oh no, hold on, not till after the election. Are we ever going to pass a replacement plan for this?" So it's a really good, important point. It was interesting. I was with the president when he said said that, and he first he stopped and talked to the media and said, "We're going to be the party of health care." And he came in and sprung it on the Republican senators at lunch last week, and uh, it was either last week and week before. But anyway, and a lot of people sort of gasped um, because they haven't seen that as a real winning issue. But his point is this, and I. And, and, and I, I don't I don't disagree with his point, and that is that 
you know, right now, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, as we know, is considering this case to determine whether Obamacare is even constitutional. And and the, the case stems from um, a, a ruling in Texas by a district judge that it is not constitutional, that because of the individual mandate going away or the, you know, the, uh, the tax penalty for people that don't have individual health insurance, um, that this district court ruled that then it's a uh, it's unconstitutional. He did not stay the the uh, Obamacare, however, so it's still in place. The Fifth Circuit is now considering it, or at least a panel of the Fifth Circuit. If they uphold the judge's decision, I mean, that means that Obamacare is unconstitutional. And if, if it continues to go all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, and there's a lot of people who think if it does do that, whenever it happens, that it would, in fact, be deemed unconstitutional, then what do we have to replace it with, other than going right back to um, what we had before? So that's that's the dilemma. And, you know, there, there's all the, the skies falling rhetoric, of course, again, that that means that you know, 20 million people will be kicked off their health care plan. Well, all it means is that you don't have to get it if you don't want it anymore. That's a far cry from being kicked off of it. And it wouldn't have the, you know, maybe some of the large subsidies. I would think the court in that case would, you know, would have some sort of, sort of a glide path. But in the meantime, I do think it makes sense to have some things in order. Um, North Dakota, of course, has Medicaid expansion. Uh, we did come within one vote. I say we. We passed it in the House, and the Senate failed by one vote. We all know that famous day, that famous night, uh, when John McCain gave the thumbs down at the last vote and, and killed the, the replacement that would have been very good for North Dakota. Um, I would think that some sort of a Republican health care plan would look similar to that, to a to a, a Graham Cassidy or something that, that is more block grant oriented, oriented, gives more authority to states. Um, but we'd want to watch all of that very, very carefully. I, I think association health plans, frankly, are one of the very important, good first steps. President Trump has already issued an order that is now being uh, an executive order. that's now being carried out by the Department of Labor. That's why I had Labor Secretary Acosta in North Dakota a couple of weeks ago to meet with insurance companies and um, in, in associations like Farm Farmers Union and the Farm Bureau and and uh, Chamber of Commerce and others to look at the uh, possibility of helping individuals and small businesses associate together and to be able to provide the same type of health care that the vast ma- vast majority of North Dakotans already get from their employer, from their large employer. That's really when health care is at its best, when you have a lot of people in the pool and a lot of variety. And, and uh, most, most Americans, frankly, and, and many, a large majority of North Dakotans get their health care from their employer. And uh, that's a that's a far better program than the uh, the Medicare for none, as we like to call it, which would eliminate all private health care altogether that, that the Democrats are pushing and just have a, a one size fits all government run system. Larry on Twitter uh, asks, we spend billions on NATO, but Germany makes a big purchase of Russian natural gas. Why spend U.S. tax dollars to defend Europe when they are in a large sense supporting the country we are trying to protect them from? Now, I know. Uh, the and I had the press release here. Uh, NATO, uh, the NATO G- uh, Secretary General uh, just addressed a joint session of Congress. So, kind of a timely question here. But to his point, you know, I, I mean, it, it's kind of a, it's, I mean, they're, they're buying a lot of energy from Russia, and, and simultaneously, Russia is kind of the a, a threat to to to, to Europe, and, and in fact, the the threat that NATO was was formed to uh, to oppose. Well, he's exactly right. And so this is why President Trump took on Angela Merkel a couple of years ago. It seems like it was probably a couple of years ago now at one of the one of the conferences. It wasn't a NATO conference, but some European conference uh, over this Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline. And, and we're looking at sanctions, uh, sanctioning that pipeline now. And the reason is that it that um, it's a it's a pipeline that brings Russian gas to Germany, to Europe, through Germany. Uh, Germany would be facilitating a, a pipeline system throughout its country to get, you know, gas to other places, um, and paying some hideous amount of money for it too. And and so while they're making themselves dependent on Russian energy, and then at the same time they're not paying their fair share of NATO costs. Now I will say this, and the, and the Secretary General talked about it today, and he in fact he complimented Donald Trump uh, and. A, expressed appreciation for his strong support for for the other countries other than the United States to to you know lift a little more to to uh pay more of their own national defense and they've gone up 
you know, uh, considerably already, and they're going a lot further, everybody that is except Germany. And so I think that the, the uh, tweet is right on point, um, which is, again, this is why Germany is being treated a little bit differently than the rest of Europe. But the rest of Europe is, has stepped it up considerably thanks to Donald Trump's strong uh, urging. Um, but he's exactly right. There's an irony, a hypocrisy, really, in, in Germany's uh, posture with regard to NATO and, and Russian energy. Uh, another question from Twitter. Ask him why many Republicans seem unwilling to review Mueller's full report, given that it presumably exonerates the president. And if that only increases public suspicions that, in fact, it doesn't. Um, well, first of all, uh, the uh, most Republicans I know do support it. In fact, so does it. So does Bill Barr, the, the uh, attorney general. But I, I might just say it's not. This is not so much a Republican issue. I mean, the the, uh, the Department of Justice responds to prosecution and to, to prosecutorial uh, findings by indicting people or not indicting them. <laughs> and in this case, there is no indictment to be had. So they basically they, they basically are responding the way they always respond, except in this case, because there's so much more interest in Donald Trump than there is in anybody else in the world. And because the Democrats made this such a hallmark and promised beyond a shadow of the doubt that this that crimes had been committed, that collusion uh, was was certain, um, you know, they're feeling that the sting of, of the rebuke of the of the Mueller investigation that finds no collusion. Now, the report's going to be released by mid-April. Now, some people are going to scream and holler. Some names are redacted or some some test some testimonies redacted. But people have to also understand that in an investigation, particularly one that involves witnesses from other countries, um, these are informants uh, for the Department of Justice, that they have to be protected. And if they're not protected, you're never going to get good witnesses. You're not going to get people to testify. That, so um, I have no doubt that, that if they if they were to hang Donald Trump with the cross, Democrats would complain that the nails weren't rusty enough. I mean, it's there's no pleasing them. But most Republicans I know want uh, want full disclosure of the report, even though it's not required at all. Um, but they're just a lot of Democrats are disappointed in the outcome. Uh, last questioner, but he's got two questions. His first question, I'll, I'll ask him separately. His first question is, are you for or against closing down the border and why? I, I don't support closing down the border. I think it'd just be it'd be economic chaos, and really, it's it's a little bit like it's a little bit like like taking guns away from law-abiding citizens. All you do is just sort of force the uh, I mean, you, you stop legal commerce and legal immigration, legal crossing, and illegal crossings will just continue. The one thing it would do is put some pressure on Mexico, and I think there's you know there's plenty of ways to put pressure on Mexico without just shutting down the border. And you could do it with you know less aid or you know, some other means, but uh, I, I think a complete border shutdown would be too chaotic. Second question is, which is more important to you, reducing child rape or cheap avocados? And I'm, I guess I'm not sure the context of that question. I suspect it has something to do with, uh, you know, the, the border and trade. Um, yeah, your, your thoughts. Yeah. Well, I don't really understand the question either. Um, I, I suppose the question presumes that if you shut down the border, you're no longer going to have, you know, children trafficked. My point is, shutting down the border will have nothing to do with having children t- trafficked because all you'll do is stop cheap av- avocados from coming across. But you've done nothing to stop. Well, people um, who are doing things across the border illegally are already doing something illegal. I mean, this right. this sounds like like uh, like putting up a gun free zone sign hoping to stop gun. Si- right. The only people who That's follow right. gun free zone laws are people who will follow laws There's and law don't by. murder other right. people or don't use guns for illegal purposes. So. Uh, exactly. I don't know. That that seems a strong, uh, a strange question, yep. uh, Senator. Thank yep. you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. Thanks. That's it for today's Plain Talk podcast. Uh, if you would a, a favor, if you're listening to this 
podcast on a platform that allows you to rate or review something like uh, iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. If you would leave an honest rating and review, I would sure appreciate it. It helps. Uh, it helps get the show out there. It helps the show uh, reach new listeners. So that's a very, very good thing if you would do that for me. If you have any feedback on the show, email it to Rob at sayanythingblog.com, including questions for our weekly guest, Senator Kevin Kramer or Congressman Kelly Armstrong. Uh, or if you just want to say hi, you can email me and say hi. You could also say hi to me on Facebook or Twitter. If you just search for me, Rob Port, I'm on there. Say Anything Blog has a page on Facebook and a uh, Twitter account as well. So if you want to follow those, they're great ways to get all of my content, blog posts, print columns, and well, this show, uh, those are great, uh, great accounts to follow. Uh, and uh, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. We'll talk again.